Well, we are continuing, but nearing the end of our series that we've called Generations, where we are casting a vision for the future of our church. But if you've been with us, you know by now that this vision for the future is very much tied to and linked to the past, to who we have been across the generations. And so we recently launched how we're talking about what we're supposed to be doing now, our new mission when we said that we are inviting all generations into a growing life with Jesus Christ. A beautiful way to express that is on a Confirmation Sunday when one of the generations of our church expresses their faith in a real and meaningful way. Over the next several weeks, we explored our values, our motives for what we are doing. With our values, we answer the question, why? Why ultimately do we do what we do? So we began with intentional growth, the value of intentional growth, and we said that we focus on growing in our relationship with Christ and in our awareness of God's kingdom. We then had a guest preacher who shared with us the value of devoted community. And we said that we're committed to sharing life and ministry together. We also explored the value of joyful generosity as we enter this harvest season, this generosity season in our church, saying that we can give of ourselves knowing that every gift comes from God. And last week, we looked at our value, our fourth value, our fourth and final value, the value of abundant compassion, saying that we're moved to express deep love for others modeled by Jesus' ministry. As we wrap up the series next week, we will look at or try to answer the question, how do we know when we're being successful? How do we know that uh, we can see our vision, our mission lived out in a tangible way, and how can we ourselves on an individual level take part in accomplishing that mission. It will probably be the most individually focused message in this, season, in this sermon series next week, so I hope you'll come back and join us for that. Today, we're focused on the question of how. How do we go about accomplishing this mission? It's a very good question. In fact, it's a question that churches should be thinking about. I want to start with a true or false question. If you would, uh, turn to the person next to you and answer this. Most churches, true or false, most churches have a strategy of some sort. True or false? Turn to the person next to you. Answer that question. Well, without being able to pull you immediately in the moment, I'll let you know that uh, that's false. Uh, in fact, researchers have showed us that 98% of churches in North America don't have a strategy. Could you believe that? Most don't have a way to think about or frame how they're doing what they're doing. And that's okay. And, and many times uh, to be a church is, is simply to be in Christian community together. But those same researchers has, have also showed us that the more clear a church's strategy is, uh, the simple, as simple it is, as it is and can be to be in life together, the clear, as clear as a church can be about articulating those steps as part of a strategy, the more effective a church's ministry can be. Uh, one way we're thinking about how we do that is in the way that we're framing our vision. The writer G.K. Chesterton once said that art consists of limitation. He went on to say that the most beautiful part of any picture is the frame. You might be sitting here and thinking, well, I don't know about that. <laughs> I don't know if the most beautiful part of any picture is the frame, but I think what Chesterton was trying to say is that how we frame a picture matters. And for him, seeing how something was framed, seeing how a picture or a piece of art was framed, made all the difference. 
And so we, as, as part of this vision process, have been seeking to frame our vision, much like we would frame any piece of art. A, a, a frame has four sides. Uh, so we've started with our mission. We've talked about our values on the other side. N today we're exploring our strategy, the question of how, and then next week we'll fill out the frame, we'll complete the frame by talking about how we measure our vision. We're framing our vision so that it might be more effective as we seek to employ it or activate it. So that it might not just blend with everything else happening in the life of our church, but it might stand out because it's framed, because we can see it even more clearly. Framing is not inexpensive, nor uh, does it uh, take only just a little bit of time? It can be very time intensive. In fact, I learned this this past Christmas when I purchased a surprise gift, uh, a print that I wanted to give to my wife, Sarah, as a Christmas gift of something that caught her eye, an artist that she liked. So I went to the local framing store and I, I said, hey, I'd love to frame this big print. And they said, well, let us get back to you with a quote. I'm thinking, well, how hard can it be? to get me a quote on what it would be to, to frame this print. Now, to my astonishment, probably not to yours, what happened is that the frame cost more than the print. And I'm thinking, are you serious? <laughs> Little did I know the cost involved in framing something. It's because what we frame matters, and the frame itself is crucial to what we're trying to display, what we're trying to communicate. Today we're going to look at Matthew's gospel in the very last chapter, chapter 28, and we're going to look at how Jesus framed his final words to his followers, to his disciples. It was Jesus' vision as he was casting it for his disciples as they were going to carry on the church going forward, and he was framing it for them. So we're going to jump into Matthew chapter 28. We're going to come to the very end, the very last words in Matthew's gospel. But what we'll find is that the end is really a beginning. So we'll read together. You can follow on the screen or in your Bible or one we've provided for you. In verse 16, it says this, Now the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain to which Jesus had directed them. When they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. And Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything that I have commanded you. And remember, I am with you always to the end of the age. The word of the Lord. Jesus has laid out his vision. In fact, their mission, if we could capture it, Jesus' mission as he's articulated is to go and to do what? To make disciples. Now, a disciple is different than simply saying uh, to make converts, to simply... Uh, draw up the masses and increase our numbers. A disciple is something much different. A disciple is someone who is walking the walk of faith, who is asking questions of faith, who is exploring their faith, much like our confirmants have done this past year. Jesus lays out the mission. Maybe he paused. I don't know. Maybe some of the disciples scratched their head and thought, well, how are we actually going to do that? How are we going to accomplish it? Maybe they didn't. Maybe Peter did, but maybe none of them did. I wonder what they thought when Jesus laid out this mission. Well, thankfully, he went on to quickly answer the question of how. How we're going to go out and to make disciples. He said we're going to do two things. We're going to baptize and we're going to teach. 
that's how we're going to do it. We're going to baptize in the name of the Father, Son, and Spirit. And we're going to teach. You're going to teach everything that I've commanded you, everything that I've instructed you. You're going to use my playbook for ministry. The disciples had a much clearer path forward because of this. And I would say, that the Christian faith became a movement because there was clarity around the question of how. There was clarity around the strategy. Is it clear to you? It's clear to me this morning, and I think it was clear to those followers of Jesus, those disciples who were going to go about doing this work. This is what we call the Great Commission, as Jesus sends out his disciples to all the ends of the earth to do this ministry together. He was giving it over to them, turning it over to them, but he wasn't leaving them without clarity around how to go about it. As part of this visioning process, we have been thinking about that same question over the last several months. And we have gotten clarity around how we hope to accomplish our mission of inviting all generations into a growing life with Jesus Christ. We've come up with uh, four points, four parts of this strategy in answering the question of how. The first is worship. Would you say worship with me? Worship. The next is grow. Grow. Serve, serve and invite. invite. Worship, grow, serve, invite. These are things that our church has been doing for the last hundred years. The first 126 members of First Pres here in Wheaton have been doing each of these four things. But what we're hoping to do is bring them into a clearer focus to keep them at the forefront so that when someone enters into the life of our church or as you sit here today and you're wondering, what does it mean for me to be involved in the life of First Pres? You can know that it means following these four steps, that worship is first place. Worship is the very first thing we're doing at the beginning of the week, the Christian week of Sunday. The first thing we do, we do is worship. That's what God called us to do. That's what Jesus' disciples did. In fact, the moment where they were gathered with him for the Great Commission, he called them up to a mountain. It wasn't simply a pep talk, though he did say that he would be with them, but it was also a moment of worship. The mission began with worship. As the disciples were living in ministry with Jesus, he would, also, he would often use moments to teach and to equip them. That's why grow is the second part of our strategy. That we would be growing in our life together and in our relationship with God. That we'd be seeking out opportunities to, to connect with Bible study groups, small groups, education offerings, confirmation classes. That we would be focused on growth. Serving is the third part of our strategy, that as we worship God, as we learn and grow in our faith, that we would respond by serving. Jesus himself said that I didn't come to be served, but I came to serve. Do we need to say any more? Do we need any more motivation to have the heart of a servant ourselves? to serve in the way that Jesus taught us, to, meet, to help to meet the needs of those around us. We would love to invite you to get involved in a, a serving ministry throughout our church. We have nearly 30 mission partners. If you come across uh, some of the activities any given month, if you look at the church calendar, you're going to see opportunities to serve both internally within the church and externally in the community. And finally, invite. We want to be a community. We want to create 
an intentional culture of being invitational. That as we get excited about what God is doing in our lives and in the church, that we would want to be inviting others into it. As we talked about uh, during our, our first message of the series, when we introduced our mission, we looked at when Jesus called the first disciples. Jesus' first act of public ministry began with an invitation. That, I think, is worth paying attention to. Which is why that fourth and final part of our strategy is to invite, to be inviting of others. Those we, those, those we know well, maybe we're inviting our, our family to take part in a, a service project here in the church. Maybe we're inviting a coworker to a special worship service that we have here. Maybe we're inviting uh, someone we just met at Starbucks to join our group Bible study. Would we be committed to being invitational? If I could admit this morning, I would let you know, which I am. <laughs> I'm going to let you know that uh, maybe like some of you, I don't know, I am a directionally challenged person, okay? I don't really have a good innate sense of knowing uh, where I've been or where I'm going if I'm driving or hiking or going somewhere. And my wife, Sarah, would would absolutely agree with me this morning. She would second that. The problem is that I, I might get so focused on what I'm doing in the moment, I kind of lose track of, of where I'm going. I don't really have a, a sense, or maybe I'm, I'm walking and I'm just, I'm paying attention to, wow, that's a beautiful tree, and I'm just thinking, where was I going? <laughs> Something along those lines. We need to know how to get to where we're going. So we can think of our strategy as a map. And we can think of the four aspects, the four parts of that strategy as four dots on the map. Worship. Grow. Serve and invite. Those are our four map dots to follow so that we know how to get to where we're going. We know how to accomplish our mission. I hope that you'll take this to heart, and I hope that you'll not only have clarity around this, but understand why we're doing this. We will become more effective in our ministry together. We'll be able to do far more than we ever could without a strategy as we live into it and employ it. I invite you to consider how you're involved in expressing your faith and also how you're involved in the life of this church. I want to remind you of that pep talk, that closing line that Jesus gave to his disciples after he told them the mission, after he told them how to do it. He said, guess what? In everything, I'm going to be with you until the edge, end of the age. I'm going to be with you forever. So just know that if you, if you lose your place, if you stumble, if you get lost, Jesus is with you. If you get sidetracked, if you notice a tree or a squirrel and you think, wow, that's interesting, but where was I going? Jesus is with you. If you feel like you're all alone and there's no one else in sight on this map that you're trying to follow, know that Jesus is is with you, and he will be forever. May that encourage us as we live into this new strategy and this new map for what it means to be church together. Amen. Would you pray with me? Lord, uh, we give thanks for this opportunity to live into the hope of the gospel by following with clarity the strategy that you lay out for us. Give us encouragement to follow and give us strength to live, to take the steps of faith, knowing that Jesus is always with us. And it's in his name we pray. Amen.